Right again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. There we go. So I'm just really happy. I have um, I had the chance to be with Michael earlier today and um, have some conversation or listen to him talk. And, and when I knew he was going to be here a little bit longer, I said to Manny, can I, this is a way for me to, you know, have a conversation with Michael and he can't say no. So <laughs> here we are. Um, you know, I've been as many of you may have maybe a, a fan and following just his, um, just, I, I told him earlier, I wish I had a history teacher like him when I was in school, because I probably would have paid a little bit more attention in history, only to find out he's actually an economist. So, <laughs> um, so wanted to just have this conversation with him. Um, we'll be able to have some questions a little bit later, but now I get to, to start. And my first kind of thing is to just say thank you for coming. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> um, and then the next is really around um, my own mind. The first question is just really around this, the social media, the Twitter, the the feed, the, th the threads and all the different, like how did that start? And you know, like, and the, and how do you do that? Like, are you just sitting and writing and, like cutting and pasting and putting in the Twitter, like how are you doing this amazing writing? Uh, that's basically it. Um, so I don't know how it started. It wasn't an intentional thing. Like I am going to do a thing on Twitter. I think like some ideas or something will spark an idea. Usually it happens on Twitter. And so I'll respond on Twitter. It's like, oh no, this is what you think. But this is, and it's usually it's a, what a lot of people think, but this is why you're wrong. And a lot of it is just about <laughs> critical thinking and knowing facts instead of assuming stuff. And so that's how it started. I don't think there is a, a, a an art to it. I just think I just say a lot of stuff and don't feel that I have to confine myself to like 280 characters. <laughs> well, I think that um, that piece there, like the art of um, the thread is also like this idea that you're not confined to the 280 characters. And then as you are doing this, the like challenging illogical thought, mm -hmm. right? And also, as you are challenging a logical thought, it must create a bevy of a, additional illogical thought and responses. Like, and so how do you manage that as you are going through, um, you know, do you just kind of just post and not worry about what people respond to? So, so if I'm being honest, a lot of it is not actually knowing that people have these illogical thoughts. So, you know, for backstory, I was homeschooled by my, my mother and it was only a couple of years ago, maybe during the pandemic, when I had the realization that when I think about history, like, oh, uh, people learn about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and, you know, the founding fathers and the constitution, and then they learn about slavery. So they, they have this idea of this pristine, beautiful America that emerged out of nowhere. And then they introduced the bad part years later. And so me having learned a lot about history and even about language and about reading at home, I don't have a concept of what people think is true so it, so i'm often astounded like oh a lot of people think that right <laughs> like you know like you just you know innocent stuff like i didn't know that people didn't think of thomas jefferson as a slave rapist and a smart founding father <laughs> like he was both of those things to me and i don't think saying that he was a slave rapist which he was like you cannot have consensual sex with property. Mm. Saying that does not take away the fact that he wrote the Declaration 
of independence or does not, you know, it is a thing that happened, right? How you feel about it and how you, like when I say he was a slave rapist, it is a fact and that should not change how you feel about Thomas Jefferson. It should add to it, right? Like he was just a man who did things. That's what we all are, people who do things. And some of those things are influenced by our society and by our history and by economics and by the politics. But ultimately, judging, we should judge the actions or not even judge, right? Like we catalog what he did, right? And you can't erase mm. some of the stuff to buttress the image of a man who was a founding father. Because to me, the bad parts of Thomas Jefferson does not erase the good parts of Thomas Jefferson, right? When I see a person who is a racist, I do not automatically assume that they kids or that they kick their dog <laughs> or that they are dumb. Like it is just a, a part of that person's persona that is, right? And, and that's one of the things that I try to explain about racism and white supremacy. It is not like painting people as evil. Mm. This is the country that we have formed and that we have built and to say it is a racist country is a description of a factual attribute about America. It is not, you know, uh, uh, to castigate this country as a whole, right? Like you could get rich in America. It is a wealthy country. It is a, you know, it is a, a very uh, patriarchal country. It is a country that is interested in money. It is a country that offers opportunity. It is a country that gives us a lot of things, but it is racist too. Mm. It's just a word that describes the country. It doesn't mean that, like, it doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, America allows opportunity for people that you could come over here and get rich, right? When I, you know, when I say America, is a racist country and somebody responds with, oh, America will we'll find another country that's better. Well, I don't understand what that <laughs> point means. Like, I'm not saying it's good. It's not good. I'm not I'm saying that America is a racist country and it is a country that like my people and my ancestors helped build too, right? So like, I don't wanna leave because I have as much and sometimes more of an investment. Like I didn't even receive the dividends on the, the okay. labor and the sweat and the money that I and my ancestors invested in this country. So when I say that it is a racist country, you know, like I have a house, right? And, you know, my, I need a new roof on my house. So if I say I need a new roof, like the answer is not, why don't you just move to another house then? <laughs> right? Like I'm just saying, like I like this house. I love this house. But I need a new roof, right? Yeah. So, but you say, as you were saying that, I was just immediately drawn to when you talk about your upbringing and your, your education and all of this back and forth over critical race theory and what we can and can't talk about in the classroom or schools. And so where are you in this kind of conversation? Again, I mean, you've said it, right? Like this is the history, but should we be holding back some of it so folks don't feel bad? Well, first of all, it assumes that like, the history that we teach now does not make people feel bad, mm. right? Like if you learn the history that is currently, like I assume that it's currently taught because again, I don't, I didn't really go, I took high school history, but I don't know like the fundamentals of what people learned. Like I, I can read, you know, sixth grade history that my kids have or whatever. Um, but I don't know the fundamentals of what people learned in history. My mother had a lot of textbooks around the house, but it assumes that that we're not learning. Like so when you, I think people paint critical race theory as infusing this angry version of black history mm -hmm. into the regular 
quote unquote history <laughs> and not that it is a white version of history that we learn, right? And not that it is like we learn, for instance, that the Civil War, not even that it wasn't about slavery, right? But that half of the country approved of it and half of the country didn't when most of the country didn't approve of the civil it was it's like a couple of people versus everybody who knew it was wrong like by 1860 everybody knew slavery was wrong right so the version of history that we learned is a white history and what we talk about when we're, we're talking about critical race theory is to me weird because it comes without admitting that we've been learning a white version of critical race theory the entire time. You cannot say that, for instance, you cannot talk about the constitution without saying that, oh, you know, half of the people were slaveholders, right? They believed mm -hmm that they could own human property. That informs you about the Constitution more than, well, it was three people from South Carolina and the esteemed gentleman from Georgia, <laughs> right? Like those may be important facts, but the fact that they owned human beings is also important. Right, and I think that that's the part people really struggle with. I, I you know, came up in the, the confirmation hearings last week about, you know, whether, um, you know, future Supreme Court mm -hmm. justice supported critical race theory, and then just really getting more into this idea and notion that it was born out of um, law practice more than it is this idea of this, and it almost makes it, I was wrestling with, well, are we saying that if we, you know, if I read Maya Angelou, am I now doing critical race theory because in some way it's racialized? I, I mean, that's what I've really been struggling with. And, and the other thing about the entire critical race theory debate is that no one ever gives an example of like who, where this critical race theory is being taught in a sixth grade social studies class, who the children are that are being harmed or if the version, like, like juxtapose, like I would welcome an argument that said specifically, hey, instead of teaching this angry black thing, we should <laughs> teach this thing, right? And to give, if you gave me examples of this, these things that hurt white children's feelings, right? Then I could understand it because I could give you some examples of the way we teach history now how it erases and hurts black people, right? Like if you talk about the English settlers that came to Virginia and the Dutch settlers that came to uh, New York and the Spanish settlers that settled in Florida and then all the, just the Africans <laughs> that they brought over here, right? Just Africans, just black people, right? right? They, and they know where they got these people from. They know that like the Gold Coast of when when they couldn't figure out how to feed people in South Carolina, and then they realized that oh, the slaves aren't starving because they're eating rice, and then they went back to Africa and the specific to the specific communities that knew how to grow rice, and the only places that they were large rice growing places on the planet and then got those people and brought them to America. They knew who those people were, right? The historians know. They know the three ways to grow rice. And to just call them Africans mm. erases the, like I was, I wrote an article for American Airlines a couple, uh, right when the pandemic started about the uh, plantation tourism uh, industry. Mm. And so I visited a bunch of plantations and one of them, uh, was a, the plantation in South Carolina where rice was first grown. And, and the plantation is still huge. And there was, the, there was a system of dams and pulleys on the plantation. And someone asked, well, when the hurricane came last year, you know, how did this place survive? And they says, well, what we did is we used 
this this damming system that dams the river to flood the plantation like they did when they were growing rice and then we just let the water out after the hurricane but that system was engineered mm. by africans on that plantation the white people did not know how to build it it was engineered so you know we like to think about the labor but not the intellectual property that was donated or invested into this country by violence um but when we think about those things right and erase the specific history of the people who they brought here like but say the english and the dutch and the spanish like that's critical race theory because the africans are just black people who don't matter mm -hmm. but the white people have specific national and ethnic identities that are tied to what they contributed to this country that's critical race theory mm. wow <laughs> I'm like still processing. Yeah, I'm just like, wow. And so it just, then my next question is, because that's a lot of information. How are you gathering all the, like, what are you just, like, where are you reading? Where are you pulling? How are you just getting all this information and just maintaining it? Right. So uh, that's one thing I like to point out is that, like, I am not uncovering hidden information that was you know <laughs> that's stowed away in this, a vault somewhere like all this information is readily available like the teachers just choose not to teach it right it's when you look at the history of america like so i remember when i found out about head rights it's like does everybody know what head rights are so uh when the colony of virginia was founded when jamestown was founded here. Yeah, a lot of people I discovered didn't know this. Like, you know, the jet, jet, most of the Jamestown settlers starved to death. Like they were just rich people who came over here. They didn't know how to build things. So they all starved to death and they began eating each other. They were, they mm -hmm. had to cannibalize each other until the next shipment came. And then they all starved to death. And then the next shipment came and then they all starved to death and they kept starving to death until you know, the King of England basically made an edict that gave every person in America 50 acres of land for every skilled laborer that they could bring over here. So first they brought over, you know, German craftsmen and Irish indentured servants until like 1653, a guy named George Menifee figured out, hey, what if we just brought slaves African slaves over here, like we don't ever have to set them free. And so, you know, George Menifee brought 150 enslaved people over here and got, you know, 1,500 acres of land and it became a thing, right? So, and then when the South Carolina colony started, it was written into their constitution. And the reason I point this out is that you know, when I learned this, I was like, like a little kid. So it always surprised me that people think that the people who succeeded in America worked hard. Like, no, they just <laughs> own people. Like, so like, I, I, it, I, was, I was the one that was perplexed. Like, what are you, what are y'all talking about? Like, y'all know about head rights, right? Like, you know, like they got rich because they owned people. They didn't know how to do anything they were not people who built this country they just owned people right like i just I, I i live in a house that was owned by a family and when i researched the history of the family it says that over the course of between when they came to america in 1800 they got 281,000 acres of land through head rights. Wow. That's the size, that's larger than the size of New York City. Wow. And this family they, is like, they built an empire. And we think, oh, they worked hard. No, they just owned people. Like wow. they didn't do anything but own people. Right. They didn't like in, in 
the house, like, is a historic house, and it was named after the family. And I was like, oh, we got to change the name of this <laughs> house. I was like, why? Because they didn't, you think some white people who owned a hundred, like, a white man and his wife who owned a hundred black people got their hands dirty building a house? Mm. No, you know who built this house, right? And so, again, it is not that I'm trying to, like, dismantle anything. I'm realizing slowly that people don't know history. Like, you really think Thomas Jefferson owned all of this land and had time to rem- <laughs> to do the philosophy of, of a democracy and to write all of these letters and to do all of these experiments? How do you think he got all that time with, when he owned a farm and had a nail factory? What do you think he was... Because he owned people, right? And so when you learn, but again, this isn't hidden. Like the books that they read, Thomas Jefferson's political philosophy, he also talks about how to treat slaves. He also Mm. talks about, well, you know, if we set them free, we'll have to send them back here because they might intermingle with white people and we can't have that. Mm. Like that's in the same book as when he was talking about the concept of democracy. Wow. So what they choose to teach is intentional. You don't have to unearth it or you don't have to know where to look. It is just what they choose to not teach. So in that choosing to not teach, like as we move forward and we have these conversations around social justice and you were talking earlier today about um, not fighting racism, but fighting the, the, the manifestations of it, right? Like, is there a strategy around teacher education or curriculum or something that then get to like what gets included versus what gets excluded? Well, I think, I think the key to all of that, first of all, is critical thinking. Like, I don't, I think we have been so conditioned to accept things. Like, we don't think critically, like, if this was the way, if I was building an education system, would I build it this way, mm-hmm. right? Like if I was going to teach people the history of this country, would I start with like 17 white dudes, <laughs> right? Right, because because you, not the indigenous people who lived here before the 17 white dudes came, right? Like just, because that frames the history, right? Like, you know, the indigenous people who, who, who lived here in America, they had, like, they voted. They had confederations, they had states, they had a delegations who came together to make the laws and the rules. It was a United States of America before white people got here, mm. right? And so when you choose to teach, start with the 17 white people, what you're saying is, and, it, and this is like important, it's not racist, it's white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Because the, what you're doing is making the white people more important than the, all of the history that came before the white people came here. And then when you say the white people have names and place, they and came from places and had kings and all of that, but the, indigenous people didn't and the Africans didn't they just were people who didn't have skills then what you're taught teaching is white supremacy not racism not a feeling but that white people are more important than all of the history all of the knowledge all of the things that actually made them wealthy and successful and built America and I think, I don't think you could imagine building a system like that today if you started from scratch. So where do you start from scratch today? Well, I think the first thing you have to do, like you cannot start from scratch if you don't point out why you need to start from scratch. So you got to say, hey, you know this white supremacy, right? Like this whole (laughs) thing that we're doing inside these classrooms that is instituted into the curriculum of the American education system erases, like it doesn't teach history. That's the first thing. 
right? Like not, even if you didn't consider the feelings of black children or the history of Native Americans, you are not teaching history. Like on that same tour, uh, when I was writing that article about uh, four American airlines, there was a plantation, the McLeod plantation, that is one of the few plantations that is trying to like teach history of the place in the right way. And so one of the things that the historic interpreter told me was that, you know, the family that lived in this home was never more than three people. And they always owned more than a hundred enslaved people. And for years, we've been talking about the three people instead of the 100 people mm. and calling it history. Mm. It is this, you know, it is objectively not history, right? To take like a small percentage, a 3% thing and make it the most important thing is not history. And the only thing that you can logically say is, well, we're teaching the part about the white people because they're more important. Mm. So flipping that on it. So when you were when you were kind of going through that, I was also just thinking about, OK, so we're going to flip that. We're going to have this conversation. We're going to move through this. And as we prepare and come off of um, the confirmation hearings, like how do we like what is the history of that? Like, how does that story play out when you think about um, I was just talking with Precious about the the way that we saw the questioning of um, of the of, of the future hopefully you know supreme court just and the dignity that she had to like stay sit there and take it and you know smile and then you have cory booker come in and, and just acknowledge and say i see you but like how does that what's that story look like five ten years from now again it depends on who gets to tell it or which side but when do we get to a place where we own that things are not right yeah so Again, I think you have to start with calling it what it is, right? So you have to objectively compare it to, we have enough examples of how a Supreme Court nominee is confirmed before then, right? Like it is like they are intentional about not being political, but you got to talk about CRT with this one. Why? Hmm. Right? And so, I think you start with asking all of the people who are confirming this Supreme Court nominee, why do you think it is that it was all white people, like it was 97% white people before now, right? Mm -hmm. There were black lawyers, right? there were uh, African-American judges, that we knew they were qualified. So what you are talking about is a system that you have constructed to select Supreme Court judges. And all of them just happen to go to some of the whitest colleges and some of the oldest colleges that were constructed when black people were officially determined not yeah. human. And the legacy of that, right? Because what you're talking about, like, I don't understand how you can say, we have to honor the founding fathers and this constitution and the history and the tradition of the Senate and the right to, uh, to it consent and advise the president. But all of that racism stuff that they did back then, we ain't, that's, that's so gone away, right? <laughs> all of the history, should inform what we do now, except for the racism part. If you think critically about it, it doesn't make any logical sense. But we have been taught to like ignore and not think of it critically. It, it, it's perplexing to me. Again, like we sat there and watched them question her, knowing, which is weird to me. Like pretending as if they were going to vote for her if they got right. the right answers. Right. <laughs> right. Like that's the, that's the, that's where you start, right? Like if you ask them, hey, 
will you vote? What answer will make you vote for her? Mm -hmm. They will not have an answer, right? So it sounds crazy, but like if if she just blabbered <laughs> incoherently, <laughs> it would have been like it wouldn't have made a difference. So like the first thing we have to do is to stop pretending that the questions or her answers make a difference. Hmm. Like we knew that they weren't, like Mitch McConnell was not going to vote for her. <laughs> and we were pretending that like the racism part was the questions <laughs> when it was all a charade. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that idea and notion too of um, it's all a charade, right? And you had talked earlier about, somebody asked you, you know, how do we dismantle racism? Right, like what's the, and, and you know, so I wanted you to share more of this idea and thought of like, we're not, like that's not the focus of the, the work, right? This idea that you're just gonna go in, because if somebody had the formula or the solution for that. Right, um, like, so I think racism, and when I say racism, I wonder, you know, like I don't have a concocted definition of racism, I just go by the dictionary, right? Right, the idea or the belief that race is inherent to a person's character or traits, or a system, political, social, or economic system that perpetuates that idea. Right, so I don't think racism has anything to do with intent or uh, you know anger. Like you, I don't think that every racist hates black people. Right. I think that they, like we have constructed a world, you don't have to hate black people to be racist, right? Like that's the so-called beauty of it, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> you could just do nothing, right? Like you can just teach the same history that your sixth grade teacher taught you and the same history that that sixth grade teacher was taught and perpetuate this idea that white people are superior. Right, like you don't have to, you can say, well, everybody who ever came to this college took this standardized test, knowing that the standardized test was created to keep mm. black people, Jewish people, non-white people out of college. And, but we've always done it this way. So the thing that we can't do is focus on how white people feel, right? We'll never be able to change white people's belief or what we have to ch change is how racism manifests itself, right? Like I, when I was growing up, I had a terrible temper and my mom couldn't change my temper. What she did is teach me how to react when I got angry. Like stuff still makes me mad, mm -hmm. right? but you don't throw stuff, <laughs> right? Like, so we don't, I don't care if white people dislike black people, if we they are able to control that feeling or that emotion that makes racism manifest itself in the real world that I am in, right? So you can, dislike me, but if you see that I am as qualified as someone else, like I had the best candidate, mm -hmm. right? And the thing, the crazy thing about it is that system exists at their own peril. They would rather hire, like a lot of times they would rather hire someone less qualified or mm -hmm. they would rather, like you have to really be intentional about excavating history that makes white people look that beautiful, <laughs> right? Like you can, you can just teach the whole thing that Thomas Jefferson wrote, but this, the part that you pick and choose, like it takes so much effort that like it's like you could be easily doing something else, right? And so the economic and the political and the social benefit like we like to think that it benefits white people, but it really don't, <laughs> right? It really doesn't. 
again, I use um, education, right? Like we know that places that have bad education systems have more crime. And when there's more crime, I always like, whose windows do you think they're gonna bust out? Right, they're gonna bust out your windows. Like all you gotta do is just have some equal schools, right? <laughs> and you could have less broken windows. You would could walk down the street and feel more secure, but you would rather perpetuate that system that you think benefits you and not have to compete with black people in education and in, in politics and economics because you think it benefits you, but it really doesn't. So with that, as we think about, um, you know, and I know you, you saw that um, the California State Reparations um, Task Force came out with um, how they're going to decide who gets the money and trying to, you talk about economics and policy and education and all of that, this idea of who gets the money and how do we address or make amends for the, the harm? Like, what are your, what are your thoughts on this idea of not even just reparations? I really wrestle with this myself around like, is it reparations? Is it restoration? Is it about um, just acknowledgement of the harm that was done? Is it about like, you know, return on investment for generations before? Like what, what's your take on all of this? So my take on it is, on reparations is that one, I don't think you give people reparations. It is the money that was stolen from the labor and the equity that black people invested in this country. So when you think about reparations, you know, let's let's forget about slavery, for instance, for, for a second. So in, in 1940, in the 1940s, um, a school district in South Carolina in Somerville, in, in a town called Somerville, uh, they filed the first of five cases that would become Brown versus Board of Education. The town was 75% black. The school district had 35 school buses and the black school, the black school asked, hey, can we just have one of these school buses? And they said, no. Now, the reason they asked for, for the school bu uh, bus was because there was a lake and a river in the school district that the kids had to cross to get to school. And like every now and then on the way to school or on the way back, a kid would just drown. Like, you know, they would try to float across there and it would just drown. So that's why they wanted the bus. And that's why they sued their school district. But the interesting thing about Somerville is that like, it wasn't a place where the black people were poor this this town was right outside of a paper factory and like it had one of the highest employment rates in the country. Um, they had a black middle class. So that was just as, as wealthy as the, the white middle class in this town, but it was 75% black. So the white people were a small minority who got all of the school buses. So what, what you're saying is that those black taxpayers, hmm. their money, their tax money was being stolen and given to the white kids to build generational wealth. Because in South Carolina, people don't know, South Carolina was a majority black state until like the census of 1940, right? 40% um, of all enslaved people in America came through South Carolina. So it was a majority black state. And in that state, they had one Black HB, black college, publicly funded black college, South Carolina State. But South Carolina State was built by a land grant from the federal government. So all, they had seven whites only colleges. So all of the tax money for higher education was going to build white people's generational wealth. That is theft. It is not like, like the money that they invested in their state they did not get the benefit of, right? So when you're talking about reparations, 
even if you didn't own slaves, all of the white people in South Carolina benefited from that theft, from segregation, mm -hmm. from like, you know, it is, it, there is no debate about it, right? Like they got education money that black people paid. The majority of the state was black again, mm -hmm. right? So their money built generational wealth for white people. So what reparations is, is not saying that like white people wouldn't be paying reparations. It would be America, right? Like just like we owe social security debt, just like we owe China money. It's not like the people <laughs> who got Chinese stuff only pay taxes. It's not like people who have kids only pay school taxes or people who have cars only pay for, to build the roads. Everybody pays it, right? That's what a society is. And so South Carolina didn't, but South Carolina did not differentiate between black immigrants and descendants of slaves. Mm -hmm. South Carolina did, if you, and then, you know, the practical questions of it are not asked because again, we don't learn history, right? Like what, if, what about somebody who was brought here in 1689 before America was a country and then they were emancipated mm. before America even existed. Are they an American descendant of slavery? Or how about the Americans who lived here who owned plantations in Barbados mm. and other, other colonies? Are, are the people who became Jamaican citizens are they American descendants of slavery? What about slaves that were enslaved in America and then escaped on the Underground Railroad to Canada? Are they American descendants of slavery, right? Like there's so many of these practical questions and then it puts the onus on tracing your lineage on the people who were stolen, <laughs> right? The people who we were just talking about, they didn't tell us where we came from. They right. were just Africans, right? right? So, it is not just impractical, but I think ultimately that idea is an idea that segregates us. It's like it's a white supremacist idea that it's a, a bunch of different kinds of black people, mm. right? Like it was some immigrants and then the slave people are different because again, the reality is if all black people got reparations, It'd be a lot, e a lot less easy to take than if a certain segment of black people got reparations. Because the way to make black people more secure is if all of the black people got money. Because it's hard to take money from you know thirty three million people versus seventeen million people, mm. right? And we know this country is great at finding loopholes. But here's the but here's the the other practical questions, right? So you guys have a law that says like you really can't infuse right. put race into the law, right? Right. So think about this. There are more white descendants of slaves mm -hmm. than black descendants of slaves. Like there like if you your family has been in America mm -hmm. since the 1600s or the 1800s and you get a DNA test and you can prove that you descended from, mm. you know, you've passed for, and descended from, mm. you know, a slave, your mom slept with a slave or your dad. Right. So it's like, you are des American descendants of slaves. Now you know, <laughs> there's gonna be a, a bunch of white people at the front of the line waiting for their reparations check. <laughs> if you don't restrict it to, you know, if you, if you try to make that distinction, Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of just like the people, because this country didn't differentiate between, you know, somebody who came here as a slave in 1822 and somebody who came here uh, as an elected. Like, they, they didn't they pay taxes and they, their kids couldn't go to school in 1900. Like they were segregated. Mm -hmm. It was like you uh, uh, African. You just think about this. Right. So think about Louisiana that had millions of free people of color when we purchased it from the French, those people were descendants of slaves. 
right? A lot of hate of, of people from Haiti came because it was a French colony before we bought it. Are they American descendants of slaves though? Like that's a question that we have to ask ourselves and we'd rather make those small distinctions than just say, oh, this is what a thing that we did to black people. So as you were talking, like to make it real personal, like the two things came to mind. One is this idea of worthiness and deservedness and, and kind of saying who gets to have the money and trying to justify and figure out. And then the other piece of it is um, tracking the lineage, right? Like I know even for I was sharing with somebody earlier, like I can get to my grandmother's father and then you get to the next thing and it's like, I can see his mom, don't know where she came from. One, one census, she's mulatto, the next census, she's black, another census, and it keeps going back and forth, but you can't see who fathered her kids. You can't see where she came from. And so what happens in all of that? Because in terms of history and who documented and who was worthy of being, their birth was worthy of being written, there, those records, you know, somebody was saying, you know, maybe we need to have Henry Louis Gates do it for everybody. You know, like what, what does that look like? Right. And, and a lot of those people who became, quote, unquote, unquote, became white, we know why they became white. Like it's a lot easier to be white <laughs> in America and to keep those because they didn't tell their children. Like it's generations of people who, you know, there's a, there was a podcast on the guy who had the, Black Swan Records, the guy who had the first pop music record label, a black man. Um, he started a record label. He kind of like reinvented jazz and the music industry. And he actually fought the case that desegregated Chicago um, for the family. Like the story of uh, A Raisin in the Sun is actually Lorraine Hansberry's father, I mean, parents were the people who desegregated Chicago. He was their lawyer. Mm. And, you know, he, this is just a, a brilliant man who then disappeared and became white. And his grandchildren didn't know this. Like they had a picture of their grandfather on their wall and until the people who do, did the research for this podcast asked them about it, they didn't know that they were, they had black lineage, right? And there were a bunch of people like this, the people who funded and, and paid for Plessy versus Ferguson, which eventually resulted in the separate but equal rule. They were free people of color in Louisiana. And some of those people, when they made the separate but equal rule, they said, well, you know what, we're probably going to have to become white now. Mm -hmm. And so some of those families don't know that they have Black lineage, right? And to put the onus on those people to trace something that, a situation that America created by that disparity is weird to me, right? It's like saying, like, somebody stole your TV, but we will pay you back, but you gotta solve the case. Like not the police, not the detectives, like you gotta solve the case. And if you solve the case, we will prosecute the person. Like it's, it's a weird yeah. thing that they've created. Well, it, as you were saying, I recently read this book about um, Walter White, who, you know, was, and I'm reading through a history first off the the book opened my mind and my eyes to like all the lynchings and you know we think about Emmett Till but there are all these other ones that built up to that space that actually built the foundation but then here's Walter White a man who could pass for white and most people thought he was white and the I think Time magazine in the 1930s put he was a Negro by choice mm -hmm. and folks thought that that was insane you know, and that he was doing this to go and investigate these lynchings. Right. I mean, you think about, you know, the generation after uh, Sally Hemings, like they, you know, intentionally had a meeting and say, hey, are we going to be white? <laughs> or are we going to be black? And like half of the family said, you know what, we're going to be, I'm going to be white. And half said, you know what, I want to be black. Right. And which is how 
we know about Thomas Jefferson because half of his grandchildren intentionally chose to remain quote unquote black. Um, and so, and, and, and I don't fault the people who didn't make that choice because again, it's like, you're talking about survival. Like you're talking about, like if you mistakenly look somebody in the eye you could die. So, you know, it's not just this ephemeral like choice that we're making that ties you to your ancestors. It is about your future descendants survival. How does that play into though, this idea of um, twice as good for half as much or this, the way that families, black families specifically were tr teaching their children right, to be prepared to go into society if they chose or if they didn't have the choice about being black, right? Like understanding that when you walk into a room, there are some, some things you have to do um, as a black person. I think, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. That's a question that I can't answer because like I, I was homeschooled because my mother did not, I think she thought that teaching us and us having to learn at that age what is required of you and what the world thinks of you infuses you with subconsciously maybe with a self-worth that is less than so my mother when I was writing my last book I at you know I interviewed my mother about it and she told me and I, I, I she never told us why we were homeschooled. I thought it was like, well, I can teach you. It's just as good as you do. But she told me, and I'll never forget this quote, I do not believe that a black child's humanity can be realized in the presence of whiteness. Mm. And wow. so that twice as good thing is true. Like we've had to, but what if you like one and a half times good, <laughs> right? Like you... <laughs> You will think like I can't make it because I'm only one, like I am only just as good as the white people. Mm. Right? <laughs> like that is a thing that you have to kind of put into a black child's head. And like the refusal to do that, I think is is admirable too, right? right. I, because what you're choosing is survival temporarily versus but, but in reality right like ain't no way to escape whiteness right like you just have to be you cannot conform conforming will not save yeah right yeah. so the 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 job of a person is to be as human and to assert their humanity mm. And I think that a lot of times we as Black people do not recognize the small ways that we acquiesce mm. to the perception that we are less than human. And the reason I know that is because I did not learn that. And I think that even the way that I talk to and about white people is considered aggressive mm -hmm. and confrontational, just even in using the words white people, when it's just a thing that I never learned, right? Like I never learned how to couch my phrases, my words to make them palatable because somebody didn't grow up in the culture that I was in. But so unpacking it a little bit. So that's the, the education piece of it, right? But when you are um, growing up, South Carolina, mm -hmm. like what does that look like on the streets? Like I, 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 I'm originally from Texas. Um, I remember spending my summers there and I remember knowing like, don't walk on that side of the street. Don't walk in that person's yard. Don't like all of those things that I learned just in terms of like the societal social pieces, which is very different than the the, the education and it just, rem I remember, and the other thing you said made me think of somebody who said to me, 
this woman who was like, I'm tired of being resilient, right? Like I'm, I'm, I want to be able to not have to be twice as, I want to be able to be average for a minute, right? Like that idea of, you know, some of it is survival when you go outside of the home, right? So did you experience it in that regard? Well, so I lived in a black community, okay. which, so the interesting thing about my hometown is kind of like some of the, that the, there was a huge paper factory, like an international paper factory in my hometown that kind of, well, I don't know if they did, but they didn't really discriminate on who they hired, right? So there was a black middle class and there was a white middle class. The town is about half white, half black. So like, I did not really interact. I did not have to interact with, like we had a guy who delivered eggs to our house. My, my grandmother, he would deliver like dozens of eggs and then my grandmother would sell those eggs to people in our neighborhood. He was white. Um, the dude who was the manager at Piggly Wiggly oh God, was Piggly white. Wiggly. And that was like <laughs> the extent of my black, my white interaction. Right. Right. Well, so, I mean, I had to go to, I was, um, the arcade games were big when I was, yeah. but it was in the Piggly Wiggly. Right. But the Piggly Wiggly was in, I had to walk there, but it was in the white neighborhood. Yeah, this was in the white, it was like in the on the boundary between the white and the black neighborhood. But so I had I'd never really interacted with the concept of like having to adjust my actions or my thoughts or anything because of white people. Like either I wasn't around them or they were in my world, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the Piggly Wiggly was the black and the white store. The, the man who delivered the eggs, he came to my house. So like, I just didn't learn how to do that, which is probably why I still like kind of struggle with that. Yeah, yeah, to walk in those spaces. Um, I'm gonna open it up for folks in, in a minute, but I just, for me, just coming back to um, that idea of being able to just be, right? Like not having to measure yourself against what is, defined as um, best or better and just being able to just live life. Like how do we get to that space for folks to be able to not have to be like, I gotta show up and be always the best, even though, even if I'm the best, it's not gonna be considered the best. Uh, well, I, that's, that's a question that essentially assumes like, like we can recreate this world as an equal and racist world. Like, the only other thing that will, the other only way to do that is to like not care what white people think. And I think that we are slowly getting there, right? Like, you know, I don't think like you even have to say it out loud. Like <laughs> there are some things like that there's a framework in, in Africana studies that is called like it's the governance structure, which is how black people relate to each other. And then the social structure, which is like society, like the society that America is, like politics, mm -hmm. economics, and right. So I do not have to like, like for instance, with the Will Smith and Chris Rock thing, like to me, that is like an example of governance structure. Right. It is not that I do not want to hear white people talk about that. It is that their conversations do not matter to me, right? <laughs> like I know that, there, that what I saw was a governance structure thing, whether it was like, and I know people in, to disagree with it or with one side or versus the other side, but when they watched it, they knew what it was, mm -hmm. right? And it is impossible to explain because if you exist in that governance structure, you know, like I disagree with what Will Smith did, but I knew what ha was what happened, right? Like you knew what that was. And it was like in a governance structure, like how we relate to each other, we like everybody's talking about violence. Like we know hitting a man with an open hand on his face ain't like you're not trying to choke him or punch him. Like you're trying to embarrass him. Right. But you so when people call that violent, I understand that they are talking in the context of the social structure mm. and not 
how we relate to each other. Right. And I think that what we have to do is know that we are in a community and we have to stop pretending to adjust ourselves to that social structure and relate to each other in the way that we know how to do. So I just, I wanna, I'm gonna go to the audience for real, but the, um, so when you said that, it just made me think like, oh, wow, like this is the thing we keep talking about in so many spaces about how I'm letting your experience or your point of view define what I do. And, right. and so what you're saying is that we need to get to a place in some ways to fight it, that I don't let your definition overtake my reality in some way. Right. right. Like, and I don't know like how to squarely like how to unpack that a little bit more. And, and, and the reason that is so hard is because most of us simultaneously have to exist in that governance structure. Like we have to relate to each other the way we relate to each other. And then we have to relate to, to the larger world, to white people. Like, you know, it is a thing that and every black, black in this room has heard this before, like has heard that black people know white people better than white people <laughs> because we have to we have to consider what white people think and we have to consider what we think well white people like their world is just the world right, right? so they don't necessarily have that insight so we have to be cognizant of of that right but they don't even really have to consider that right like mm -hmm. we have to make some calculate like for instance I have a bald head, right? And I really don't like hats. So I wear a lot of hoodies. But when it's cold outside and I go inside a store and it's like a convenience store late at night, I have to consider the fact that I am a black man wearing a hoodie at night in a convenience store. And that is a thing that I have to think about because I know it is threatening to some people, right? Like, no just being white in society, you don't have to think about that, right? And it's not like anything is going to happen to me, but it's something like, I know, for instance, if I'm in a parking lot and I am behind, I walk kind of fast and there is a woman walking in front of me, like if she's white, I know, like I gotta slow down to walk slower than her pace because if I get too close coming up from behind her, she might get frightened. Mm. Like, that is a thing that I have to be aware of. So I have to think about what white people think all of the time, right? And that is like, I have to switch from that social structure mindset to the governance structure mindset if I'm around black people, right? And I know that like, those are two worlds that I have to simultaneously exist in. You were talking, I was like, you don't know how many times I bought clothes I did not want because I thought the people thought I didn't have money or that I was about to do something in the store. And yeah. so I was like, well, let me prove that, you know, I'm not about to rob you by spending my money. Yeah, I, I mean, it happened to me today. Like, like I was buying some stuff in a couple of different stores and I have to think, hey, what will they say if I bring my bag from the other store? into this store and so i just always ask like is it okay but yes yeah yeah but it's a thing that i have to ask because sometimes it's not okay and i know that perception and i know how i look in the world in the social structure but sometimes if you if you make that decision if you make that decision to not care in, for instance, in a store or some other place, it could have some pretty heavy right. ramifications. Right. It, 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 I know, like, you know, I've been in cars where with white people and we were stopped by the police and I was like, oh, I can't talk to the police <laughs> like that. Right. And so like, you have to make those kinds of decisions for survival in this country. Yeah. Well, any questions in the, I know I'm like looking at Eric already, like, the, do you have a question, Eric? No. I do, but I, 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 I,
black California, although when I was in Louisiana, folks, there's no black folks in California. Right? <laughs> space, right? And I lived in DC where there was such a white black binary. It was so foreign to me because my dad said I was Mexican because I was in stolen land of yeah. different people and Mexican. Right? And I grew up in Richmond, that is a quarter white, working class, quarter black, quarter Latino, and a quarter Southeast Asian from immigrants, right? And so, in living in a quarter society as a black man, and a society where there's not a lot of black immigrants are equaling the sort of the brownness, I think there's two questions, and I'm not going to get into them. One is, <laughs> how do we keep the integrity of Blackness and the Black struggle within this new context of pluralism. And two, what are the opportunities to create either allyship or, you know, pat that brown immigrant and go like, yeah, that's some shit. Here go the rules right now. I mean, I want to understand that space because we function in a city that's four percent black, right? That we're important for black women mayor didn't bring up work. But, you know, it's a space where I have to function as a Black man within the context of this brownness around me, because that's how I feel support. Um, so I just wanted to sort of lift that up from the, the California, no Black from California. Well, uh, so I do think that, like, anti-Blackness is specifically different from, like, racism, right? Mm -hmm. And when we kind of lump them in together, it is because we are defining them all from the perspective of whiteness. Like everybody who ain't white got, like, and it's true, everybody who ain't white has something to deal with, but we have different things to deal with, right? So black people are the inheritors of the legacy of slavery and free labor and the criminalization and the demonization of the color of our skin where you know other people have different depending on like you know Mexicans have have a specific kind of uh, racism or uh, xenophobia to deal with as do Asian Americans but it's all different right? And I think that like lumping them in together, it almost gives too much credit to white people as if they've like they concocted some kind of system when like, it's just different things that they apply in certain scenarios, like you ain't white, right? <laughs> so you probably lazy if you are Mexican or you probably violent if you black. Well, you know, like it's it's a different, you might be a terrorist if you're brown or you know what I'm saying? Or you here for Sharia law. Like it's so many different kinds of things that the only origin, like the only connecting connective tissue to it is just like white people made it up. <laughs> so, but what is like, and, and I really believe that you cannot understand that studying black people studying Latino people. You gotta understand white people, right? Like that's, uh, people think that when I call myself a white peopleologist, <laughs> it's a joke. But when, like when I, my mom sent me to school, like I had to, because of the stuff I just described to you, I had to like, oh, I don't know nothing about white people. And it seems like they are the ones who make the rules. So I gotta just find out what white people think, like and study white people and be intentional about knowing how to relate to them, right? And while it seems like a joke, right? Like it's the only logical connective tissue is that like for every other demographic, ethnicity, race, creed, color, it's like they made something up to separate that group from the privilege and the promise that America can offer. And so, I don't, I, I think you don't concentrate on all of those little things. It's always going to be something new, right? <laughs> like, I don't know, there's not a MS-13 and now, you know, we don't, uh, you know, we like too much seasoning on our food or <laughs> now we want to block traffic. Like, and, and, you know, now it's Sharia law and like, it's always going to be something, right? You can't keep up with it. 
unless you say, oh, the white people are gonna make up something for us, <laughs> right? Like that's what you gotta focus on. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, one, you said something that really hurt, uh, was when we teach history, um, it's in the context of slavery, mm -hmm. but no one talks about the poverty. Wow, I never thought of it that way. And no, it's not that way, but it's so true. Uh, but my question is, since since capitalism is, and I've asked this question a lot to folks, and I still haven't figured out my perspective on it, but from your perspective, since capitalism and racism was from together, was built together, uh, do you think that capitalism and racism are inextricably linked? And you can't have one without the other, or at some point can we separate? Well, so as an economist, what you're talking about is American style capitalism. Like, because capitalism exists, what we call capitalism exists in other places. Like there's rich people in other places. There are like, you know, one of the things that you probably won't find in other places is people who are as rich as there are in America right next to people who are as poor as they are. So this idea of capitalism is a false dichotomy that we believed in, like it's gotta be some poor people because if it's gonna be some rich people, when unregulated, what, what you're talking about is the unwillingness to regulate the harm that an economic system does for the benefit of the people who are extremely rich, right? Because that's what like slavery, other countries says that, you know what? Like we can't be doing this to people. So we gotta stop slavery. And the reason America didn't was because we was making so much money on it, right? So when you talk about like the economic disparities, like, you know, uh, segregation, the redlining, right? Like the reason we allow that to happen is there was so much money in it, right? And so to put that at the feet of capitalism, I believe, because what you're saying is like, we're going to have to stop businesses from being profitable uh, or to stop people from making, and it's not true, right? Like they're multi-billion dollar global countries who can do that without harming the people and extracting, like, like, you know, doing it and not paying it. Like Amazon doesn't pay any taxes, right? And it's, that system exists because we allow them to do that, right? Because Jeff Zuckerberg would still be, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg would still be one of the richest people in the country if he paid taxes, <laughs> right? So it's not really capitalism that, and I agree with you that they're inextricably tied, right? But I don't think that you have to kill capitalism to stop racism. What you have to do is create a system that says the importance, the, the wealth, the health, and the welfare and the equality of human beings is more important than money. And so when the two butt heads, we're gonna choose people, right? And there are countries that do that, right? Like we can't say, like the, the, the reason we say we don't give people healthcare is not that we don't have enough money, but that the insurance companies will go away, right? Like we know there's like countries across where hugely rich people live that also have socialized medicine, hmm. right? There are like, so. I think slavery and racism was born out of capitalism, but it does not. 
necessarily have to be so. It's like saying, right, if um like if you like religion breeds war. That's not true, right? Like a lot of wars are religious, but it does not necessarily like there's some religions that exist that are peaceful religions, right? And so like when you say the two are inextricably be tied, we 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 can concoct a system. It's 2022. We can imagine a system that doesn't have to harm people for people to be economically successful. Thank you. So maybe one more before Precious comes up and closes us out. Yes. Uh, so it's called Black AF History, the Unwhitewashed Story of America. <laughs> and so it, it includes, it's, I think it's, I think is going to be funny because it, <laughs> and it, it talks about some of the stuff that we talked about today. So, you know, in this book, like I teach history using some of the tropes that we, we talked about. So, you know, I was intentional about going, like if we talked about uh, the enslaved people, I talk about the different uh, kingdoms and the tribes, but the white people are just white people <laughs> in the book, right? So the white people came here and they start eating each other, right? And so, you know, it's funny, but it is like, it is thoroughly researched and it is the story of America from the perspective of a black person who is teaching 